My, 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 what have we here? Playing on the job, are we? Oh, that's not important. Forget about that. Let's just say I've been making sure that this company stays afloat. Anyway, come on. We got some things to do. We're behind schedule as it is. Come on. Chop, chop. Hey, guys. Auction of Tef here. And welcome back to another episode of our... M uh, uh, what are they doing over there? Uh, oh, where's, where's the horn? Where's the horn? Uh, was it in the first chest? Where? Oh, there it is. There it is up in the corner. Where was I? There we go. As I was saying, welcome back to our today's episode of our Minecraft Civilization Challenge series where we're building up Parawadget, and it appears that our sort of shrine industrial zone area has sort of been taken over by pillagers. And they seem to be worshipping a sheep? Maybe they've converted to the religion of Neath. I, I, I don't. I'm not dealing with that. Um... Uh, so instead, uh, let, let's say we go focus on something else, eh? So, the biggest thing that often sort of curtailed the expansion of a civilization tended to be its access to food, as well as other sort of trade and resource goods. So with the village expanding in this sort of area here due to our increase... In, oh, whoops. Uh, let me just fix that. But uh, as I was saying, because the village has been expanding a little bit, we need more food. And there's sort of two ways to get that. We can either produce more, which is what I'm doing here. We're going to be building a brand new fishing dock, sort of as a companion to the other one, as well as maybe some farming fields in that area behind the first fishing dock. And not again. One moment. Uh, let's just put this up so I can put some wood, which we don't have. Well, I'll finish the pathway first anyway. And the other major way to get a large supply of food and other sort of related goods is trade. So that's sort of the whole purpose of this episode. We're going to be building up some food stores and we're going to be building up trade goods. So uh, I'll be right back after I grab some wood. Okay, so I got the wood and we're back on to building here. And I just wanted to mention really quickly uh, that that idea that I was positing that you can sort of trace development in a civilization slash culture slash society via the sort of distribution and production of resources, um, namely food and trade resources, as I said, is a historical idea called historical materialism developed by a very little known historian, well, pair of historians, you probably never heard of them, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. In fact, actually, it's the core thesis of, uh, well, Marxism. The idea that you can trace the material welfare of a population, the production of goods, who produces, who receives, and so on and so forth, and uh, sort of trace that as a historical lens. And it has since been adapted and sort of distributed and changed and all these other things to create sort of Marxist, non-Marxist, and various other ideas around this core idea that you can sort of really look into the material history of a people and sort of have see what that tells you about them. So in our case here, uh, and I seem to have forgotten even more things, ugh, be right back. So there we go, we got our boats and there we go. Now we can say we have two complete fishing docks, just like the one over there. But... Uh, back to the topic I was saying, historical materialism, Karl Marx, so on and so forth. The reason why I brought that up is it is a very good way to sort of see how and why societies develop. A lot of Enlightenment thinkers had a problem in that they'd explain various stages of the world, right? So you'd have your idea that, oh, all civilizations, all societies must go through a stage of barbarism, a stage of sort of civilization, so on and so forth, but they didn't really explain how they changed. And the whole idea behind this uh, materialism, historical materialism, was it explained why a society grew ch and changed. In this case, it is a society changed in relation to its technology and the production of various resources. Specifically, in our case, it's food. So... 
we started with some very basic fishing, and now we're expanding the fishing, and then we're also going to be branching into this episode into agriculture. So we have expanded the, our technology base, we've expanded our food base, and thus our society is able to grow and expand because of the increase in resources. However, we're not just going to stop there. We're not just going to start stop with a few food, uh, storage depots. We're going to actually expand even further to include a trade depot. The idea being that not only are we expanding our local production, but we're also sort of growing our trade uh, sources as well, so that we can get goods from even beyond our local area. Last time, we sort of focused on our local production, and now this time we're going to be expanding our foreign trade and uh, looking at sort of who Egypt traded with and the development of the uh, lower Egyptian uh, culture in relation to its neighbors. So, with that being said, uh, what say we uh, take the opportunity to just look at this lovely little build and uh, move on to the next little area? Okay, so this is going to be the next little area we're going to work on, and that's our fields. As I mentioned before, we are going to do a wheat field, maybe some... Uh, wait. Yep, still worshipping the sheep over there. Good to know. Anyway, as I said, we're going to get like a wheat field, maybe a melon field, and some sugar cane, which is already growing there, so... What say we get started on that? So, our first big priority here is, of course, just clearing the land out a bit, and that includes all of the sugarcane I've already planted here, uh, as well as any trees, bushes, or any other things that I can, technically speaking, use in future building projects. So, uh, yeah, that'll be a pretty easy clear. And the other thing I need to do is sort of flatten out the land a bit, specifically sort of cut down on... Uh, sort of this, the hilly area in the back and just make sure I got like a nice flat plane that I can work with and sort of figure out and divide what I'm actually doing here. So with all that in mind, I'll be right back. Okay, so this area now here is cleared. It's time to start building up the little, uh, what do you call them again? Lord, I forget the word. Basins, that's it. Basins. So we're going to sort of build up a little lip alongside the actual river here. So that way, much like over in Nubit, we can store water in behind where the basin sort of blocks it off. And that way we can keep our fields irrigated during the whole year. Same sort of deal. Except this time I'm going to try a little bit more of a naturalized look to it. So by more naturalized, I mean, I want to try and fit the flow of the sort of river, the earth, etc. a bit better in this one, because Nubit was based entirely around grids. This one I want to be a bit more natural, a few less straight lines, a few more curved lines sort of deal. Um, although saying that, I'll probably start with a straight line and then work to curve it afterwards. So my idea is to divide this area up into about three large fields and then one sort of smaller field for sugarcane. And specifically, I want to section off that little pond just in front of us there. So that way I can just have a little sugarcane area there and then two large wheat fields and maybe a melon or maybe a second sugarcane farm. So I'll figure that out specifically, but as you can see, I'm trying to sort of follow this natural flow around the uh, pond here instead of just outright sectioning it off in a large square, even though that, technically speaking, would be more efficient for what I'm doing here. Uh, otherwise, I should probably also clear off this little top area, make sure that it gets nice, a lot of sun, and uh, there goes all the sand. And uh, then, otherwise, yeah, I guess I'll just start planting the sugar cane just about now, that way it will grow as I just keep working on the other areas, and if I need to plant a second set of sugar cane, then I can basically just build it up as it had already grown up a little bit. So, uh, yeah, uh, there's a little bit of room here for extra. I might dig in some a little bit, uh, although I don't have a bucket on me, so uh, hmm. be right back. Okay, so one of the other things I'm doing here is I'm trying to sort of add natural looking pond areas to the sort of sections I'm sectioning off here. So I'm just gonna add a bit of a, just a little bit of a canal over to the river and then it would connect from about here. And now I don't have, oh, there's a way up. Well, actually I wanna cover that up and well, if I'm gonna do that, I might as well do this. Yeah. There we go. Anyway, yeah, I want to add this bit of a canal here because I want to have a few ponds, and there's the more curved one I mentioned here. And uh, let's add another little 
entrance canal here. And there we go. So just ignore the drowning... Drowning? Di drying? Asphyxiating squid on the opposite shore. It'll be fine. No squids were harmed in the making of this video. Um, okay, now how do I get up? Okay, yeah, now I'm trapped. Uh, there we go. But yeah, I've got a bit more of a curved one here. We're adding a few canals in. And the whole idea is this should be a little bit more natural looking. So I got a couple ponds that'll sit in each farmer's field, plus a little few holes filled with water, just like over in Nubit, but you can ignore those. Uh, let's see. And then I also sort of want to add wooden bridges over these. That way I don't need to worry about destroying the crops if I accidentally fall in the water. So with that being said, uh, why don't I cut forward a little bit to show you guys what the next sort of stage looks like, eh? Okay, there we go. So now we're just sort of, uh, what's the word? Irrigating the fields? No. Hoeing the fields? Anyway, and there, you can just see off to the left there, that's one of the wooden bridges I mentioned. It's just two wooden half slabs so it doesn't fully block off the water. And then just doing a couple smaller holes just in here because that way the water can reach. But otherwise, yeah, the fields are pretty much done at this point. I'm going to leave a few areas around the edge just so I can jump up and jump down without any problem. Uh, I have open here so I can add floodgates. And then, let's just see, yeah, there we go, that's another wooden bridge there. That way we don't need to worry about destroying crops. So yeah, that's another one done. I've already done the one closest to the house. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, Hmm. Well, yeah, I guess it's just this last area. I'm not 100% sure. I want to do a diagonal bridge, but I don't know how that will look. Uh, mm, mm. Not a huge fan. Not a huge fan. Uh, I guess this works, but it's still kind of weird. Uh, mm. Well, I'll figure something out. But more important to keep tilling. Tilling, that's the word I was looking for. Tilling the soil until... I've gotten the whole sort of area done. Let's see, there we go. Yeah, this area, maybe melons. I'm not 100% married to that idea because I'm going to need a lot of wheat because, quite frankly, I'm turning this into another mud brick city very soon because, quite frankly, there's that giant swamp just over across the river there. So, hey, the more wheat I grow, the more uh, mud bricks. I can make. <laughs> oh lord, I'm forgetting all my terminology. This is why you do not record and uh, do all this the same day you're uploading, right? You gotta give yourself time. Anyway, we got all this done. Let's see. Last stage, I guess, is the floodgates and then planting everything that I got. So yeah, I'll be with you guys in just a second. So, we're on to our last little floodgate here. The fields, I mean, you can't see it, but they are seeded. And the floodgates are in the down position, so the water does not escape during the uh, dry season. But, and, oh, oh god, no, please, no. Come. I see they're done worshipping the sheep, and now they're here to give me trouble. Ugh. Please, please, don't, don't you dare come onto the field. No, no, stay over there. Don't, don't step on my, cr oh, they stepped on the crops. Oh, God. Oh, God. Please. Hey, don't don't step on the crops, please. Mm. I worked really hard on those. Uh, okay, it seems we're on a bit of a standoff, so I am just going to... Uh, well, I'm going to show them what for. Huh. Okay, there we go. They can't get... Ow, ow. They can't get into the field anymore, so it's just a matter of getting out. Ah, out, out, out. Okay, thankfully arrows don't swim very far underwater. Uh, okay, um, oh, right, boat. Oh, here we go. How about we go use our other dock? <laughs> there we go. It's almost as if I planned it this way. I did not plan it this way. There we go. We're all safe and sound, although I'm pretty sure they're going to be moving into the village. Uh, 
there is a chance I might have to evacuate here for a moment. Oh, wait a second. There's ladders on those, aren't there? Ooh, they can still get in. Uh, right. Anyway, uh, time for a time old tradition at this point. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to, uh, let's see. They didn't damage the crops too much, so it's just, uh, yeah, the village is theirs. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go do something else. Uh, be right back. Okay, yeah, so immediately after making that clip, they sort of stormed the village. So, uh... Yeah, we're gonna be working over here now. So, originally I had thought maybe turning this into another farm area, and I might still do that, but I'm thinking of focusing actually on the water here, specifically this little peninsula thing we got over here. So, just up over here... I was thinking we can do a full-on trade port. So we're going to flatten things around a little here, build up a dock, maybe have this be like the main pier. We've got ideas. we got options. And uh, it'll also keep me as far away from the village as possible, and so I won't get shot full of holes. So yeah, I'll do a, something along this sort of coastline here, I think, and build up a couple warehouses, maybe a uh, thing or two. It's just a matter of clearing it all down, sort of flattening it out again, and then just working with what land and what supplies I got. So, uh, why don't we go over to a time lapse? Yeah. So, uh, I guess I'll start that up and I'll see you guys when it's done. So last time, I mentioned that a city is limited based on the resources naturally available in the immediate vicinity. While this is true in terms of city development, what a city lacks for could be made up easily via trade between local cities and or major trade centers. For Perwajet, this place on the Nile Delta allowed it to be a center of trade in Egypt with access to the traders from the Four Winds. To the west lay the Berber peoples, or at least the peoples that would become the Berbers over time. During this period, the Sahara desertification would have intensified to the point where the land was left barren, leaving only sparse scrubland and most of the arable land would have been left along the coasts. As such, the highly mobile and nomadic Berber peoples would have had to take advantage of their uh, ability to move about to trade. So the peoples of Egypt would see salt and various animal products coming from the west via the Berbers in Libya and beyond. To the north, though, lay the Mediterranean Sea, and despite Egypt really only having basic reed boats that they can go up and down the Nile, that doesn't mean trade was completely cut off from the north. And in fact, there would have been trade from as far afield as the Minoans of Crete and the Cycladies. And of course, the most famous of all of the sort of trade goods Egypt would have gotten from this area would have been wine, to complement the local beers that Egypt was famous for. To the east was perhaps the most important trade route, as Egypt could trade with the peoples of the Levant, Mesopotamia, and as far away as the Indus Civilization. Mesopotamia represented the center of the Fertile Crescent, and thus the center for the spread of new cultural and technological innovations from east to west and vice versa. Everything from pottery, clay seals, new strains of grain and animals like the pig, all the way over to luxury goods like perfumes and dyed cloths all could be found through trade with the east. Of the eastern trade cities, the two most important during this period would have been Uruk and Byblos. During this period, also known as the Uruk period, uh, Uruk would have been the center of Mesopotamian trade and development, possibly connected with the semi-historical, mostly mythic, King Gilgamesh. In the Levant, meanwhile, Byblos was the prime source of timber and other rare resources desired in Egypt, and it was, and is, a major port city in the region, with Byblos representing one of the longest continuously settled places in the world, from the Canaanites to the Phoenicians, and then beyond to the modern area of Lebanon. Finally, to the south, was Upper Egypt, specifically the city-states of Nakata II. So we've moved on from Nakata I, and now we are firmly in Nakata II. From them, Lower Egypt would get grain, livestock, gold, pottery, adobe, bricks, as well as goods like ivory, even more gold, jewel, and slaves from farther afield in the Nubian kingdom of Kerma. This trade was doubly important for the peoples of Upper Egypt, who saw their culture begin to expand outside their traditional lands, and specifically around the areas of Abydos, Nubit, and Neken, to include most of the whole of the Nile Valley, from Kerma in the south up and including the delta region of the Nile. 
where only Madi Buto culture sort of continued on alongside it. Okay, and here we go with just these last few fence posts. We are officially done this build. So, there we go. And done and done. The entire port area here is done. So, now all I have to do is just wait for some actual traders to come by via the ocean. And we got this nice little protected sort of harbor here uh, that they can stay in. Yeah, so we got some trade goods already in here, some flowers for dyes, various pots, and uh, other paraphernalia. We got some timber from Biblos, and we're going to trade them some of our reeds here. We could also probably trade them some paper, or at least when we start making paper, we can get them. And then we got this sort of watchtower area here, just sort of look over the port, make sure everything is going fine. It can act as a bit of a sort of watchtower 
just to make sure everything's safe. And then in behind here, we also have this sort of a sugarcane area that is connected via tunnel to our industrial zone so that we can sort of process all of the sugarcane into paper and our reeds into sort of the bamboo uh, stacks. And then we can trade those away to our neighbors. In this case, it would be Nakata or maybe perhaps a foreign trader from Mesopotamia or from the east. Or, yes, Mesopotamia is east, from the west. There we go. But yeah, we got our fields here, and here's the uh, sort of region here. You can take them here through the tunnel, and boom, there's our work zone. You can turn the things into paper here, or into, like I said, the bamboo bits, and just take them back out for trade. Boom. All done. But yeah, we can sort of just grab what we need. There we go. Grab just a little bit extra. And, uh, yeah, we can just go make some paper. So, Egypt would have actually been a great source of paper for the ancient world. Well, paper, it's papyrus, specifically. So, they'd take reeds of papyrus and weave them into a paper-like substance. And, uh, instead of the uh, pulp paper that we use nowadays, it was more of a woven sort of deal than stamped flat. But, uh, yeah, that's all here. We got our little industrial zone connection there and uh, then we can use this road here as a bit of a connector between the actual village itself and our little trade port and then of course uh, I've checked the pillagers are gone now it's been a few days and now we've got green fields full of lovely golden wheat and then we also got our melon farm here I did go with melons a few of them still need to grow in it's a lot more haphazard you can't really use the space for melon I mean I could have used the space a lot better but given the style of farm I wanted to go with I couldn't really but uh, yeah so we can just harvest some melon get some brand new ones and now we have even more sources of food and that's the thing uh, Various societies, the more sources of food you had, the better off you would be. In North America, for example, a lot of cultures actually started seeing a lot of health degradation as soon as they discovered uh, mass farming of corn. As corn became the staple part of the diet and a lot of other sort of sources fell off, they became a lot more unhealthy. But with uh, certain regions, you would have bread, you'd have fish, you'd have fruits and nuts, and that would actually increase the availability of food but also the types of food would make sure that the individual diet was healthier overall so that was sort of the whole idea behind diversifying our food here instead of just fish now it's fish fruit grain and whatever we want to trade for and uh so yeah i guess that is everything this episode uh yeah, we got all the farms up. We got our trade port in. In between, I'll be growing the village again. And this time, uh, or next time I should say, we might be looking towards the big hill here where I said I might want to build our big temple complex. So with all of that stated, I think it's about time we wrap this video up. So uh, I guess that is it for now. I'd like to thank you guys all for watching and I'll catch you guys all next time on our Road to the Old Kingdom series. This has been Oxitef, signing out. See you guys then.